The Guinness Book of Records describes the Pan-American Highway as the longest road in the world. It measures between 17 to 18,000 miles in length depending on which route you take, going from Alaska all the way to Argentina, from the top of North America to the very bottom of South America. It's one of the world's great journeys and attracts many adventurous souls who yearn to drive from one end to the other on the trip of a lifetime. However, there is a break in the road, one section which almost everybody skips over, the section where the road ends and the jungle takes over, the notorious Darien Gap. Also known as El Tapon, and variously nicknamed the Green Prison or the Green Hell, the Darien Gap is a 250 mile long inhospitable stretch of the Isthmus of Darien, the land bridge between eastern Panama and Colombia. Anyone venturing into the Darien Gap should be prepared for the following. Thick, impenetrable jungle, steep ravines, mountain peaks and deep gorges, fast-flowing rivers, followed by the seemingly endless expanse of the Great Atrato Swamp. Of course, we should not forget the local wildlife, which includes deadly snakes, herds of dangerous wild pigs, nests of stinging hornets, biting ants an inch in length, ticks, leeches, and of course, swarms of mosquitoes. Add to that the danger of gangs of armed drug smugglers and guerrilla groups, and you can see why it's been described as the most inhospitable place on earth. One National Geographic reporter who was kidnapped while tracking through the Darien Gap stated, everything in there just wants to kill you. Historically, the Darien Gap was just a blank space on the map, a place to be avoided and circumnavigated. There were some efforts to gain access to the interior, mainly in the form of a small railway built by the British around 1900 to facilitate gold mining in the area, but the jungle soon reclaimed these tentative and futile efforts at civilization. It's pretty easy to see why no one had yet gone to the effort of building a road through the Darien Gap, but that didn't stop people from trying to drive through anyway. Legend has it that two Model T Fords made the trip in 1938, and in 1959 a Land Rover and a Jeep made the crossing as part of the Trans-Darien Expedition, making extensive use of the rivers to get around. In what must have been one of the more surreal efforts, three Chevrolet Corvairs were supposedly driven through the gap in the early 1960s, although whether they actually made it seems to be somewhat disputed. However, someone certainly tried, as one of the Corvairs is still there, rotting in the jungle to this day. By the time men had landed on the moon in 1969, still no one had completed a full traverse of the Pan American Highway. And so the challenge was on, and by 1970 plans were being made to drive a pair of British Range Rovers from Anchorage in Alaska to Cape Horn at the very bottom of Patagonia. The Range Rover, launched in 1970, was arguably the first attempt made at introducing a luxury 4x4 vehicle. British Leyland, the owners of Rover, were keenly eyeing the US market, but they needed a bit of eye-catching PR to bring the Range Rover to the attention of the American public. Hence, the British Trans-Americas Expedition was born. Two standard Range Rovers, kitted out for off-roading with winches and roof racks, etc., but in essence the same Range Rovers that you could go down to the dealership and buy, would drive from Anchorage to Cape Horn. It would be a superb bit of publicity. Just imagine, a vehicle that was rugged and tough enough to have been the first to ever drive the full length of the Pan American Highway, and yet plush enough that you could pop out for a Sunday drive in roomy comfort, swanky leather seats, with a modern radio cassette player. And so, on December 3rd, 1971, the two Range Rovers were flown into Anchorage on board a Royal Air Force Hercules transport plane to begin the 17,000 mile trip to Cape Horn. The first leg of the trip, the run down through North America, has been described by lead driver Gavin Thompson as uneventful, although one of the Range Rovers was involved in a collision with a large truck on the Alcan Highway in Canada after skidding some 600 feet on sheet ice, and later on in Nicaragua they were shot at by unknown assailants but managed to escape unhurt. 
Now if that fits your description of uneventful, then let me know in the comments. Accidents and shootings notwithstanding, the Rovers averaged around 500 miles a day, covering 8,000 miles in just 40 days, and arriving in a very wet Panama City by mid-January. Just a few kilometres to the east, this part of the Pan American Highway ended, and the Darien Gap began. Now the team knew full well that they would never cross it without aid, and it was here that they met up with their escorts for the journey. A 64-man full expeditionary force from the British Army Royal Engineers, led by the wonderfully named Major John Blashford Snell. You might not think it looking at this photograph of him sipping tea from a china cup in his three-piece suit, but Blashford Snell was an experienced explorer. He'd made the first complete descent of the treacherous Blue Nile, and he would go on to fully navigate and map the Congo River. Looking like a throwback to the old Victorian explorers complete with khaki suit and pith helmet, he was a tenacious character, determined and resourceful, but the Darien Gap would test him to his limits. In later years he remarked, it was the toughest expedition I've ever done. The team set off from Panama City on January the 19th, heading for the first obstacle to overcome, the 450 foot wide Bayano River. It took three days of hard slog through muddy trails just to get to the river, a little taste of what lay ahead. Crossing the river, although tricky, was accomplished without incident, using the ingenious method of using inflatable boats strapped together in combination with sturdy aluminium ladders to create a floating platform capable of carrying a fully loaded Range Rover. When both vehicles were across, the boats were then deflated and stored in the Range Rovers, ready to be used again when they were needed. Now on this side of the river, the real jungle began. With no more trails to follow, one had to be hacked out. Slowly, a 10 foot wide trail was cleared by hand ahead of the cars. Visibility in the jungle was limited to only about 80 feet, and so all navigation had to be done by compass. It was hot. 110 degrees in the shade and around 90% humidity. In the interior of the rovers, temperatures soared to around 140 degrees. It must have been like being inside a slow cooker. The terrain was routinely punctuated by rocky streams and deep ditches, mud was everywhere, and there was the constant whine and sting of biting insects. Progress slowed to just two miles a day. Late season torrential rain turned the cut track into a quagmire and the vehicles needed to be constantly winched out of thick axle deep mud. One of the few custom features the two Range Rovers had been fitted with for the trip were oversized deep tread tyres. The reasoning being that these would provide better grip and not sink into the mud as much. In the event, these tyres were proving to be a disaster as the deep tread simply accumulated the sticky mud weighing down the wheels and putting a huge strain on the axles. The expedition crawled on, Blashford Snell and his men taking point and cutting a trail on foot ahead of the struggling Range Rovers. Behind them, the team strung out in a long line, pack horses and their carers, sappers lugging supplies and parts, researchers and anthropologists hoping to study the wildlife and indigenous tribes of the area, also present were Panamanian soldiers and even a group of Colombian convicts who had been sent along to help the expedition and to be repatriated to Colombia. That's assuming the team ever got there. Sweaty clothes stuck to exhausted men. There were biting centipedes and stinging scorpions. Vampire bats attacked the pack animals, driving them wild, sending them floundering into muddy bogs where it took hours to get them free. A tree fell on one man, he had to be flown out to hospital, along with another who had developed acute appendicitis. The men were covered in bites and sores, cotton clothing and leather boots fell apart, electrical equipment was covered in mould and had to be cleaned constantly. The Range Rovers grimly plodded on, making agonisingly slow progress up one steep slope that the team nicknamed Heartbreak Hill. Now it was around this time that the Achilles heel of the Range Rovers became apparent, the differentials. Differentials are a kind of mini gearbox located midway along the axles and they control the rotational speed of each wheel. 
A combination of the heavy loads and the oversized tyres caked in mud was proving too much for the diffs. One after another, the differentials cracked under the strain, cogs and shafts snapping and leaving the 4x4s severely impaired. Eventually, only one Range Rover could drive, using only the front two wheels, and it had to tow the other one. Radio calls back to the base at La Palma alerted the Panamanian Air Force, who kindly ferried in the spare parts by helicopter, but this was only delaying the inevitable. The final differential eventually gave out, leaving the team stranded just outside the village of Apiti. They had been going for 16 days, and had covered the grand total of just 30 miles. That left only 220 miles to go. With no more spare axles or differentials, the team was stranded. Tortuous long distance calls were made back to Land Rover UK. If this problem couldn't be resolved, it was all over. Engineers back in England worked literally around the clock, pushing an identical Range Rover to braking point to finally realise that the oversized tyres were the problem and not the solution. Standard tyres, wheels and axles were flown out to the jungle to be fitted, and after a delay of 26 days and some ingenious repairs made in the middle of the jungle, the Range Rovers were back up and running. Now, not all the team had been idle during the 26 days. Blashford Snell had been busy in Panama and had managed to scrounge up an old second-hand Series 1 Land Rover. With this, he and his engineers were trailblazing ahead winching, cutting and blasting their way through the jungle to create a track for the two Range Rovers, who would follow on as soon as they were able. Now, I know the whole point of this trip was to showcase the new Range Rovers, but I wonder if it ever crossed anybody's mind that they might have been better off just taking a couple of old landies for this trip. The old Series 1 seems to me to be much better suited to the terrible terrain of the Darien Gap than the Range Rovers were. Anyway, with the Range Rovers running again, the team were back to the grinding, punishing work of driving, dragging, winching and pushing the vehicles through the jungle. Progress was being made, but every mile was fraught with difficulty. To add to the pressure, the team had only about six weeks left to get through the Atrato Swamp before the rainy season began. Once the rain started, the swamp would be impassable. By mid-March, the trail-cutting vanguard had run into problems. Time and time again, they'd probed their way ever more into the mountainous terrain, only to be turned back by sheer cliffs or impassable gorges. Finally, out of options, they decided to follow the semi-dry bed of the Turia River. Having to constantly stop and float the Land Rover across the deep sections took forever, but at least it gave the Range Rovers a chance to catch up. Now, this section also proved treacherous, one Range Rover drove into a deep pool and was turned over. The driver, Jeremy Grives, only just managing to scramble out of the window before the 4x4 went underwater completely. The waterlogged vehicle was winched out of the river, stripped down, and all the oils and lubricants flushed and replaced. Amazingly, within 24 hours it was driving again, and the only thing that they couldn't get working was the radio cassette player. Having picked up an old smugglers trail which Blashford Snell had heard about, the team finally reached the Panama-Colombian border on April the 9th. The final obstacle, the Great Atrato Swamp, lay ahead. With no time to lose, the raft boats were inflated and the rovers were ferried as far up the Atrato River as possible. Now the swamp had its own set of problems. Large mats of tangled thick weed made it impossible to get through using the raft, but it wasn't solid enough to drive or walk on. Plagued by thick swarms of biting mosquitoes, the exhausted team cut, dragged and blasted the choking weeds for three days and nights, until they finally arrived at a point where there was a crust of solid weed, some three to four foot thick, that they could drive on. Then, suddenly, they reached solid ground, and a track that was some kind of road. They were out of the Darien Gap. It had taken the expedition 99 days to cross 250 miles of green hell. During that time, most of the men had lost between 2 to 3 stones in weight. Over half the team had been evacuated at some point due to illness or exhaustion. 
the men were covered in bites, and many had contracted malaria. Other pleasures the men had endured included dysentery, dehydration, heat exhaustion, hornet stings, scorpion stings, and trench foot. Many were at the end of their mental endurance. Only the thought of getting out of the swamp had kept them going. In terms of supplies, in the 99 days the expedition was in the Darien Gap, they had got through 15,000 gallons of petrol, 10 tonnes of rations, 2,500 cans of beer, and 4,000 packs of cigarettes. Although the 250 miles of the gap accounted for only 1.5% of the total distance that the Range Rovers would drive, it took them over three months out of their six-month journey to get through the green prison of the Darien Gap. The Colombian government gave the expedition a great reception, turning the arrival of the team into a kind of impromptu state visit. And it was in the Colombian capital, Bogotá, that the Rovers finally parted ways with Blashford Snell and his men. They were going home to fully recuperate, but the Range Rovers still had another 8,000 odd miles to go to reach their final goal of Cape Horn. With winter in the Southern Hemisphere well on the way, it was a race against time to drive the length of the South American continent before the snows in the Southern Andes blocked the mountain passes. In the end, they made it, by the skin of their teeth. The final mountain pass was closed due to snowfall just days after they went through. After six months on the road, and over 17,000 miles on the clock, Gavin Thompson and Jeremy Groves arrived at Cape Horn, the first men ever to drive the full length of the Pan American Highway. They cracked open a bottle of bubbly, had a smoke, and radioed bass to let them know it was over. Then they turned around and drove straight to the airport. It had been undoubtedly the trip of a lifetime, but one, it seemed, that neither man was in any hurry to repeat. The Range Rover never did take off in North America, perhaps fearing too much competition from the likes of the Ford F-250 or the Jeep Gladiator, the Range Rover was never officially available for purchase in the USA until 1987. Prior to that, it was only available via grey market imports. In Britain, the Range Rover was a huge success. It became one of the iconic vehicles of the 1970s, defining itself as the upmarket utility vehicle used by members of the royal family, wealthy landowners, the upper middle classes and the nouveau riche. Starting with the first revamp in 1994, it has been redesigned many times, although to me personally, the more modern it gets, the more it ends up looking just like any other SUV. Many people who buy them today are simply looking for a status symbol, and they never have any intention of using them as utility vehicles or for going off-road a trend which the management at Range Rover seemed to have fully embraced. I mean, honestly, just look at this. Can you, for one moment, imagine taking that through the Darien Gap?